Hi, I'm Mike Yaklik from the Mind, Body, Soul. We made a series of short videos to go over the rules on how they're scored in our tournaments. We're hoping that this will help the grappling community, coaches, competitors, spectators, parents, and children become a little bit more informed about the rules and how they're scored at our tournaments and lead to a more enjoyable tournament experience. Please enjoy the videos. If you'd like to get more information on how the rules are scored at a more in-depth look, please go to ibjjf.org and look for the rules there. We are striving every year to make the tournament a more enjoyable experience and move towards what IBJJF has set as the standards. Enjoy. All right, guys, uh, let's look, take a look at takedowns. Now, in order for this takedown to begin, both opponents will be standing. Now, in order for this takedown to actually occur, both people have to be standing with two feet on the ground. Now, if Professor Mike here goes for his takedown, whichever it may be, he goes for the double leg. Now, for him to, or to get his two points, he must stabilize the position for three seconds. Okay? Now, whether he wants to do it, a resting takedown, if he wants to do a judo takedown. Takes him down, one, nope. Oh, holds for the three seconds, one, two, three. He holds for three seconds, he gets his two points. We can also do a sacrifice throw. So he goes on his back. So this is also considered a takedown uh, for his points. He holds for three seconds, he gets his two points. Another version of the take that will be an arm drag. So it is arm drag. Now if you notice here, he only needs to have one knee on the ground in order to stabilize the position. And as you notice, Professor Mike has also made sure that he has circled around to the hip in order to stabilize the points. Now Professor Mike has to circle to his head. So just keep circling around, circle, 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 so you like this. If he just takes him down like this, no points will be awarded. He must circle around to the hip line in order to get the points. So uh, when you go for the takedown, you don't necessarily have to land flat on your back. So Professor Mike and Professor Lena together, he goes for the sweep. Professor Mike is able to take him down onto his butt. He's still able to stabilize the position. For three seconds, he is awarded two points for the takedown. Now, situations where a takedown, a takedown points are not awarded are as follows. So, we can do the same throw as we just did before. But right away, Professor Lane gets onto his feet before he can stabilize the three seconds. You will not get two points, but you will get the advantage for attempting the takedown. Another scenario where you will not get points is if the takedown occurs out of bounds. Okay. Now, if you take the opponent out of the boundary area, the action will stop immediately, and you'll start from uh, start in the middle from standing. You'll you'll get the advantage for getting the takedown, but because you're out of bounds, you cannot stabilize for three seconds. So another scenario that we are going to see here is when Professor Mike's goes for a double leg, and Professor Lane immediately sweeps him over. In this scenario here. Professor Lane will get two points for the takedown. Professor Mike will not get any points. Okay, this scenario occurs for the double leg takedown and the single leg takedown only. As far as sacrifice throws are concerned, that will be addressed in the sweep video. Uh, the next position we're going to look at is passing the guard. Okay, when you pass the guard it's worth three points. Okay, so this, this scenario here, Professor Lane is on the ground. Now, we're going to find guard is Professor Lane using his legs to prevent Professor Mike from getting to the side control or the mount position. Now, in order for Professor Mike to get points for passing the guard, he must pass his legs. So every decides to pass his legs, just like this. Now, for Professor Mike to get to points, he must stabilize the position for three seconds. So in this case here, one, two, three, you'll be awarded three points for passing the guard. Now, we're going to do the same thing right now. Uh, Professor Lane is still on the ground. Now, uh, he goes, he passes the guard. Now, rather than stabilizing, what uh, Professor Lane is going to do, he's going to roll onto his knees, 
into what's called a turtle position. In this scenario here, because Professor Lane's back or side are not on the ground, you, uh, Professor Mike will not get points for the pass. Okay, now if we rewind again, Professor Lane is on the ground. Now, when he passes, what I like Professor Lane to do is just start to shrimp. Start to shrimp away. He shrimps away, he's not stabilizing. He's not stabilizing, he's able to get his guard back. He's able to get his guard back. In this scenario here, Professor Mike was not able to stabilize the position for three seconds. So as we said before, uh, the guard is defined as when uh, Professor Lane's legs are used to hold the guard. So as you see here, Professor Mike is going to try to pass the guard. Professor Lane is going to try to get a shin in. You see here, now he's starting to reestablish guard. He wasn't able to pass the guard until, uh, and afterwards, Lane got his legs between himself and Professor Mike. This is not considered a guard pass. Okay, and if he takes his leg out, now he puts his, his uh, shin off the uh, bicep here. This is also not a pass of the guard because his leg is still defending his torso. Okay, until he's able to clear the legs, only at this point will guard pass points be given. So scenario where pass points are not awarded. So you can see here, Professor Mike goes to the down leg and is immediately inside control. In this scenario here, no pass points are going to be given because no guard was established by Lane. All right, so the next point position that we're gonna look at is the sweep. Okay, so in this scenario here, Professor Mike is gonna be on the ground, Professor Lane is gonna be on top. Now, in order to get sweep points, you must have a form of guard. In this case here, he has butterfly guard. So what Professor Mike's gonna do? He's gonna lift him over. As you notice here, uh, Professor Lane is now on the bottom, Professor Mike is now on top. Now, how he, what position he ends up does not matter, so long as uh, Professor Mike is able to end up on top. Okay, now uh, this scenario here now, he goes, he goes for the sweep. Now as he tries to get on top, Professor Lane actually goes and reverses the position. Oh, no. Okay, in this scenario here, Professor Mike was not able to get establish the sweep because he was not able to stabilize the position for three seconds. So in the scenario here, we're going to do the exact same sweep. But instead here, he lands in a guard position. Now, again, it does not matter whether he lands in guard or mount or inside control. Uh, Professor Mike was on the bottom position. He had a guard and he ended up on top. In this scenario here, Professor Mike goes for the sweep. But immediately, Professor Lane goes and reestablishes the position he had before. Okay, in this in this scenario here, Professor Lane is not able to establish the three seconds, so he does not get three points. But he will get the advantage. Now, if Professor Mike does the exact same maneuver, but he does not come on top, he just kicks over, but then Professor Lane goes back on top again. Because Professor Mike did not try to get on top, he's neither awarded the sweep points nor the advantage. Okay, another uh, form of sweep will be the arm break. So he goes for the arm break, and he immediately goes for the back clinch. Now he does not need hooks in this position, but he ended up on top, and Professor Lane is on the bottom. If he's able to hold the position for three seconds, he will be awarded the sweep points. Um, you are able to get sweep points for the back, in here. Now if you notice here, Professor Mike is on top, Professor Lane is on the bottom, he's able to establish the position, he will get two points for the sweep. Now if you go back, in the scenario here, he goes, but instead of landing on top, he's actually underneath. Although he does have the back position, he is not on top in order to get the sweep points. He will not be awarded sweep points in this position here. So, in the scenario here, he's going to get the sweep, but Professor Lane lands out of bounds. Okay? What we're seeing is Professor Mike is actually attempting to come on top, but however, because he lands out of bounds, he's not able to establish the position for three seconds. In this scenario here, he will not get points for the sweep, but he will get the advantage for the sweep. Okay, so related to the sweeps, in this scenario here, Professor Mike does not have any form of guard. Now what's going to occur is he's going to reverse the position in such a way that he ends up on top and Professor Lane ends up on the bottom. However, because he was not able 
to have any form of guard. This is not considered a sweep, it is a reversal. There are no points established uh, for the reversals. So in this scenario here, uh, Professor, Lange, uh, Professor Mike is going to go for the Kimura, and he decides to take him on top. He reverses the position. Now whether or not Professor Mike is able to finish the Kimura, that's not what, what we're concerned about right now. He is able to use a submission in order to get on top. In this scenario here, he will still be awarded sweet points, even though he attacked with a submission. Take a look at some positions now that, are, that will also give you points. Uh, the first position we're going to look at is the neon stomach position. So here, first mark has the neon stomach. His knee is clearly on the torso, and his hips are pointing towards Professor uh, Lane's head, and his leg is posted out. In this case here, he will get points for neon stomach. Uh, where his head is does not matter. He can be positioned high like this, or he can be high like this. It does not matter. He will still get points. Now. Professor Mike, uh, Professor Mike puts his knee down onto the ground. He still has uh, the knee on the stomach. He will not get points because he has not posted this leg out. Uh, same token, if he decides to put the knee the other way, because his hips are not facing uh, Professor Lane's head, he will also not get points in this scenario here. Now, Professor Mike goes into the proper knee on belly position. Now, Professor Mike cannot voluntarily take his knee off go to side control, hop his knee back on, and get his points for the knee on stomach position because he has voluntarily left the position. However, Professor Mike has gotten his points for knee on stomach, Professor Lane shrimps out, Professor Mike uh, goes to the side control, he pops back for the knee on stomach position, holds the position for three seconds, he will be awarded points for knee on stomach in this scenario. So the next position we're going to take a look at is the mount position. Now, at most, one arm is allowed to be trapped in the mount position. So if Professor Mike is able to trap one arm, but the other arm is free, he is able to get points, four points, for the mount position. If Professor Lane has both arms trapped, Professor Mike will not get points for the mount position. Okay, so if we're able to free one arm, now in order for him to get mount points in this position here, his knee cannot pass the shoulder. So if Professor Mike is in this position, or maybe he's going for some sort of mounted triangle, he will not get points for the mount in this scenario here. Now this is not the only position where you can get mount points. Professor Lane rolls to the side. This is also deemed to be mount points. This is a sitting mount or a technical mount. This is also considered points. So if you go back to the regular mount position, now this scenario right here, what Professor Lane is going to do is he's going to roll to the side. Now he's going to establish mount here now. Now what Professor Mike is going to do, he's actually going to roll to his stomach. Professor Mike is going to establish what's called rear mount. Now mount and rear mount are considered distinct positions under the IBJJF. Okay, so because this is considered rear mount, if he's able to stabilize this position for four seconds, Professor Mike will get an additional four points for the rear mount. Now what Professor Lane rolls to the side. Now Professor Lane, Professor Mike has established mount not rear mount, but mount. He's able to stabilize the position. He'll get an additional four points for the mount. So again, uh, we're going to talk about the voluntary relinquishment of this position. So what that means is this. Professor Mike has mount. He, and he thinks to himself, I don't like mount. I'm just going to go right to knee on stomach or side control. He's going to leave. Okay, he takes knee on belly. He goes back. He decided to leave the, the mount position and then take mount back. In this position here, Professor Mike will not be awarded points for the knee on stomach, nor will he be awarded points for the mount, because he decided that he wanted to leave the mount to go to another position. Now, in the next scenario here, rather than leaving on his own, Professor Lane is going to try to bridge up, and Professor Mike decides to take knee on stomach. Now, Professor Mike did not leave the position on his own. He was forced to leave the position because of action of the defender on the bottom. In this scenario here, because that occurred, Professor Mike, if he establishes the knee on stomach for three seconds, he gets two more points for the knee on stomach. He takes the mount again, is able to hold it for three seconds, and he'll get four more points for taking the mount. So the next scenario we're going to look at here is the rear mount position. Now, uh, as you see here, Professor Mike has what we call hooks. Okay? What we mean by hooks is, is that he has both his legs 
They're not either crossed or triangled. Okay, in those scenarios there, he will not get points. He must have the legs uncrossed in order to establish points. Now, the upper body hand placement does not matter. Whether he has a seat belt, double under grip, or any sort of scenario here, a rear naked choke grip, the hand grip does not matter so long as he has control over the upper body. So what I'd like Professor Mike to do now is, I'd like him to lay, lay down on the ground as Professor Blaine stays up. In this scenario here, even though Professor Mike has hooks, he does not have control. Because he's not able to establish control, he will not get points until the, the torsos are considered to be flush. Then he'll be awarded his four points for the back. Now, whether they're, both their bellies are up or both their bellies are down, what's the important thing is that both hooks are in, the legs are not crossed, and he establishes control in order to get the points for the back position. Okay, so if you go back to our, our butts, similar to the mouth position, at a minimum, one arm has to be out in order to establish it. So Professor Mike can trap one arm and still give awarded back points. However, if he traps both arms, he will not be awarded points for the back. So if you take a look here, how did the position occur? You may think to yourself, oh, this is hooks, I'm on his back, I, I kind of have a leg in the middle, I already have one in the middle. However, this is not considered back points. In order to get back points, he must have both legs in between, in between the legs of the opponent. In this scenario, this is the only scenario where you can get back points. All right, guys. Uh, next scenario here, we're going to talk about points for side mount. There's no points for side mount. Don't ask. Really? <laughs> 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 awesome. There's no <laughs> points for <laughs> stop, stop asking. asking. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we're gonna talk about boundaries. Anytime you land out of bounds, action is stopped immediately, both points will be started from standing in the middle. Now you may ask, but we're still fighting, how come we don't get to fight still? Well, the way we think about it is like this. If you're LeBron James and you score a basket out of bounds, does it count? It does not count. Any action out of bounds does not count. So we must start from a neutral position from the middle, standing. So the scenarios that we're gonna to present to you right now is what happens with certain submission attempts that occur that go out of bounds. So in scenario one, Russell Lane is gonna be laying down on the ground. Professor Mike's gonna take the mouth position. And he's gonna take an arm bar. So he goes for an arm bar, but he lands out of bounds. We stop the action. Professor Mike, as it looks like here, if the arm is straight, Professor Mike will get an advantage for the attempted arm bar. He will not be able to finish the arm bar because he has landed out of bounds. So in this scenario here, Professor Mike again goes for the arm bar. Now in order to escape, Professor Lane is going to hitchhike here the other way. Now in this case here, Professor Lane lands out of bounds. Once he lands out of bounds, we stop the action immediately. Because the arm was in danger, Professor Mike will be awarded two points for the submission attempt. Action will be started in a neutral position in the middle from standing. Now the scenario here, Professor Mike is going for the arm bar. Now, Professor Lane's escape is going to be to simply run out of bounds. If we stop the action there, they go out of bounds. This is not being to be a legitimate escape. You are not allowed to run away from the action. If this was to occur during a match, you will be immediately disqualified from running away from action. So the next thing we're going to talk about right now is the advantage. Okay, Advantages are near point positions or near submission attempts. Okay, So the first thing we'd like to look at is half guard. So Professor Mike is going to be on top, Professor Lane is going to be on the bottom. In order to get the advantage for half guard, actually let's reverse that. As soon as you land in the half guard position, in an advancing position, you'll automatically get the advantage 
for the half bar. Now to get the half bar advantage, you must establish control on the top position. In this case here, Professor Mike has the underhook on the far side. Professor Lane is clearly flattened out. This is clearly control on top. He'll get awarded an advantage for half bar. Now, if Professor Lane was to get an underhook clearly on his side, he still has a half bar. In this case here, Professor Mike does not have control of the half guard, he will not be awarded an advantage. Another scenario for half guard will be if uh, Professor Lane doesn't establish a knee shield. Professor Lane clearly has uh, control from the bottom, there's no control on top, this will not be considered an advantage from the half guard position. In this case here, you do not need to be flat in order to get uh, the half guard advantage, you just you must be able to establish control. Now, even though Professor Lane is on his side, it is clear from here that Professor Mike is the person in control. He'll be awarded the advantage for the half guard in this scenario here. Now, this is reverse half guard. Reverse half guard is not considered to be the same as regular half guard. You will not be awarded an advantage point for this position here. Now, if he goes back to a uh, half guard, now, if he lands in half guard, but goes immediately to a knee cut, this is not considered, oh sorry, go back into the guard. This is not considered uh, a half guard uh, and under the IBJJF. You will not be awarded an advantage here, in this scenario here, because he's going for the knee cut. However, if you go back, rather than going for the knee cut, he, he brings his knee to the other side. So he's stepping into the mount position. In this scenario here, however, because he's attempting to go for the mount, he will be awarded the advantage point for the half guard position here. So, the next scenario for advantages I'd like to talk about now is submissions. So, in order to actually get the advantage for the submission, the submission attempt must be there to a point where he is threatened. As you look here, Professor Mike clearly has a cross choke here. Professor Lane is clearly defending. And once Professor Lane is able to escape the position, whether uh, Professor Mike relinquishes himself or Professor Lane is able to escape the position, the advantage will be awarded for the near submission attempt. Now, if you uh, do the same uh, submission, but he's, he's far up. You can see here, his hands are not nearly close on his neck. The per uh, Professor Lane is not under any threat to be submitted. In this case here, uh, there will be no advantage awarded for the submission attempt. Another scenario here is if uh, Professor Mike goes for the armbar. If the arm is extended to a point where Professor Lane may potentially have to tap but is able to escape, an advantage point will be awarded because of the near submission attempt. Now, however, if we do the same, uh, same armbar, Russell Lane is able to crunch him down. And this is it. There is no arm bar. There is no threat of submission. Once he's able to escape the position, there will be no advantage awarded because even though he attempted the arm bar, the arm bar was not in a position where Professor Lane was threatened. Okay. The next scenario we're going to talk about right now are pounds. Now, uh, if I'm going to have both our gentlemen standing up here. Now, certain things you're not allowed to do, okay? Um, so things that are common, uh, common infractions that uh, we just don't want to happen. Uh, one, he has the fingers inside of the key, okay? In this case here, they'll be awarded a penalty for having a hand inside of the key, okay? The reason is, it adds additional grip, and also it's actually for your own fingers too. So please don't do that. Scenario two. Uh, Professor, Lane, uh, Professor Mike, sorry, backs up a bit. And he decides, okay, you're gonna play the game. What's he do? He puts either his knee on the ground or he goes right to his butt. You stop the action. In order to pull the guard, he must engage with Professor Lane first, so he must establish a grip, and then he can pull guard. Another common infraction that you'll see, and even though these gentlemen are wearing keys, they are wearing rash guards underneath. In a no scenario, you are not allowed to grab the rash guard, okay? 
Pretend that you don't have a shirt on. You are not allowed to grab the rash guard. It is an immediate infraction. It is an immediate penalty. Uh, so don't do it. I see everyone doing it. Don't do it. So the next infraction that we're going to talk about is guard jumping. Okay. This scenario right here. Now, even though these gentlemen are black belts, pretend that they're white belts. At the white belt and under the age of 16, you are not allowed to jump into the guard. Okay. This area, you will be awarded a penalty for jumping the car. Okay, this is for your own safety. Um, under the IBJJF, all color belts are allowed to jump guard. Um, we are doing a deviation for the safety of uh, children, so none of them are allowed to jump guard. Now, when we speak about jumping guard, we also mean uh, jumping submissions as well, such as flying triangles and flying arm bars. Those are not allowed at the white belt level or at the ages of 16 and under. Okay. Uh, the next infraction here will be the single leg. For, the, for white belts and the kids under the age of 16, for the single leg takedown, you are not allowed to have the head on the outside of, uh, of the hip. Okay? This is for your own safety. As you see here, Professor Lane has the belt. If Professor Lane was to fall, in this case he's just going to fall gently, he could potentially spike Professor Mike's head onto the ground, and we do not want this to happen. Now this will be an immediate disqualification of Professor Lane, but for your safety, your head must be on the inside of the hip. So if you could show that the proper way. So we're going to the single leg, and his head is on the inside. This is deemed a uh, proper single leg takedown, and he will be able to, uh, to, to finish this off. If your head is on the outside, you will not be awarded a penalty. Action will be stopped immediately, and you'll be restarted from standing neutral. So the following sets of penalties we're going to look at now are penalties that will result in an immediate disqualification. The first one we're going to look at is slamming. Now what is considered slamming? First mic here, he's going to lift him right up, and he's going to put him right down. Now this scenario here, first mic, we've been learning break falls for a very long time. However, you are not allowed to pick your opponent up and throw him to the ground in a violent fashion. Um, violent fashion. In this case here, Professor Mike will be disqualified immediately. Now it does not matter the height of the lift. If he picks him up and puts him to the ground immediately, it is deemed to be an immediate disqualification because the intent was to lift him up in order to get out. Even if he's trying to escape a submission, you're not allowed to slam your opponent on the ground. You must be out of control of your opponent in all situations. So the next scenario we're going to talk about right now is leg reaping. Leg reaping can be a little complicated, but I want us to establish a few certain rules. In this scenario here, Professor Lane is in the standing position. Because this, he is standing, his leg is considered to be stuck. In this case here, the furthest Professor Mike is able to put his foot is at his hip. Once Professor Lane, uh, Mike passes what we call the midpoint between his nose and his navel, once he passes this point, it will be considered a disqualification. The leg is stuck, and we are concerned about knee injuries at the tournament. Once the foot goes beyond the midline, it is deemed to be an immediate disqualification. In this scenario here, the leg is considered unstuck. Why is it unstuck? Because he is still able to move his foot. Now, in this case here, if Professor Mike moves his foot to the midline, that's too far, go back a bit, there we go. If he's able to move his foot to the midline, he'll be issued a penalty. Once this occurs, the referee will stop the action immediately, and he will move the foot back to the hip, and they will start the action again. Now, if Professor Mike moves his foot beyond the midline to come completely the other side of his hip, he'll be immediately disqualified for leg reaping. Now, in the Next scenario here, rather than have the leg free, Professor Mike is going to go for an egg lock. Now, what Professor Mike is going to do is he's going to cross his foot beyond, right to the midline, only to the midline. In this case here, because his foot's at the midline, the leg is considered to be stuck. He'll be immediately disqualified for uh, leg reaping. Now, even though, uh, even if he doesn't cross his leg over. Actually, Professor Mike, if you want to submit the other leg. This scenario here, even though if he doesn't cross over, but he still bends his knee in a fashion such that 
both their knees are pointing in the same direction. In this case here, this is considered a leg creep, and this is an immediate disqualification. Now, even though his leg is not passed over, this is the kind of position that we are trying to prevent from uh, injuring our opponents. So, if you want to egg lock, the, the knee has to be pointing either to the outside or straight up and down. Once the knee is pointed both in the same direction, with uh, the knee uh, on top being trapped, this is deemed to be an immediate disqualification. So now we're going to talk about illegal submissions for all age levels. Okay? Now depending on the age level determines what submissions are illegal at that level. So at this point we're going to talk about submissions for those who are ages 15 and under. So this first submission here is President Mike's going to go for a triangle. In this scenario here, he is now allowed to pull down on the head to finish the triangle. He's still able to go for a triangle. But he's not able to pull down on the head. The next thing over here is the guillotine. For children the ages of 15 and under, they are not allowed to go for guillotines. Another uh, common, uh, common submission will be the omoplata. And I know a lot of people go for omoplata. This is considered illegal uh, for, for the children's divisions. And even if you go in for, even if, once he lands in this position here, once he decides to sit up, that is considered an omoplata. So I know a lot of kids are going to try to go for that omoplata position, but try to finish a triangle, or sorry, not a triangle, an armbar. Even though you're thinking that you're going to go for an armbar, you're still trying to finish an omoplata, those are still considered illegal. Okay? So if we can have uh, Professor Lane on the ground now, And Professor Mike is going to take the mount position. So the next illegal submission for uh, for the children's double is the arm triangle. In this case here, we have shoulder compaction. Uh, this is considered illegal. This is an illegal arm triangle for the kids' level. And now uh, the arm triangle can take many forms. You see here, this is a dart stroke. The shoulder is being compacted and the head is being trapped, this is also considered an illegal submission for the kids' division, and they are not allowed. Uh, the last one uh, that we're going to uh, cover for the kids' division is Professor Mike's on the ground, uh, on his back, sorry, and Professor Lane is going to be inside of his guard. Uh, what Professor Mike is going to do is he go, he's going to uh, overwrap the arm, he's going to go for a cross choke. In this scenario here, because the choke involves shoulder compaction, it is deemed to be an arm triangle, and it is deemed to be illegal for the kids' division. Now, he's still able to go for arm bars and omoplatas from the overwrap. We're not concerned about the overwrap. We're concerned about the shoulder compaction for the choke. In the, that case there, it is not allowed for the kids' division. So in the next scenario here, Professor Mike is going to go for the overwrap choke. Now, because there's still shoulder compaction involved with finishing the choke, it is deemed to be an arm wrangle and is considered an illegal submission at the kids' division. Now we are not concerned about the overwrap itself. Professor Mike is still able to finish the arm bar from this position at the kids' level, but he is not allowed to finish the choke. That is deemed to be an illegal submission for the kids' level. Now, illegal submissions for both children and at white belts, there's really only one that we need to concern ourselves about, and that's the wrist lock. So in this case here, as you can see, he's clearly going for a wrist lock. At this point here, uh, if he's a white belt, he will be immediately be disqualified. Now, whether the intent was to go for a wrist lock, it, unfortunately it does not matter. Even though you did not intend to go for the wrist lock, the fact that you had the wrist lock is deemed to be an infraction and you will be immediately disqualified. At the blue and purple belt level, there are a handful of submissions that are illegal. In this case here, the first one will be the toe hold. The toe hold is only legal at the brown belt, brown belt and black belt division. As such, once you get caught in this, you will be immediately disqualified. If you take the uh, if you take the toe hold with the big toe, this is illegal at all levels. This is considered to be a heel hook, and you will be disqualified immediately, whether you're a white belt or a black belt. 
a hill hill, because your uh, traditional hill is also deemed to be illegal at the white belt level to the black belt level, whether you're wearing a gi or no gi. I know certain individuals think that because you're wearing no gi that the rules change. You are still considered to be wearing, uh, still considered to be going by your rank, and those submissions are deemed to be illegal. Now, Professor Mike here has a knee bar. Now, knee bars are illegal at the blue belt and purple belt level, but they are legal at the brown and black belt level. Now, it does not matter where the foot is on his head, whether it's on the inside or the outside, this is illegal at the blue and purple belt level, but they are legal at the brown belt and black belt levels. The next submission here is the calf slicer or bicep slicer. It doesn't matter what slicer it is. The slicer is illegal at the blue and purple belt level. So let's quickly talk about how the penalties actually work for minor infractions. On your first minor infraction, you'll be awarded, you'll be given a penalty. On your second infraction, you'll be given another penalty and your opponent will be given an advantage. On your third penalty, you'll be given you'll be awarded a penalty, and your opponent will be given two points. And on your fourth infraction, you will be immediately disqualified. At the children's level, on your fourth and fifth infractions, you will be given two points, sorry, you'll be given penalties, and, no, fuck, fuck. <laughs> don't add that. Then <laughs> you need to start from the kids. Okay. Starting at the children's level, on your fourth and fifth infractions, you'll be given one penalty point for each infraction, and your opponent will be given two points for each infraction. On your sixth penalty, you will be disqualified. 